Yeah, and sometimes these shadows, when we're not aware of them, they are what's producing the paradox in our lives. Hmm. Just by simply not being aware that this is at play. Mm -hmm. We assume that we hit it. You know, like I recently discovered my 10-year-old put a cheeseburger in my back seat. She hit it, and to her mind, it's gone. Mm -hmm. But it starts to smell <laughs> and it starts to have an effect in the car. Like there are still systems effects to the things that we do thinking that it's out of our, our, yeah. our peer view, but it's something that we need to be aware of how we're actually contending with those things. Yeah, yeah that's a good, good insight. I right, will come back to the Personality Hacker podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. We have a special guest host back with us once again on the show, Christian Rivera. Hi, Christian. Welcome back to Personality Hi. Hacker. Thanks for having me. I mm. appreciate being here. Uh, so we know what you do because you help us out in a variety of ways, but introduce yourself. Tell, Let us know what it is that you're working on before we launch into our conversation. Yeah. My name is Christian Rivera. I'm an INTP, Section 1 in the Enneagram. Uh, I have a project called Happy Chemicals. I talk about my own personal life and all of that stuff, happychemicals.org. And uh, I do a lot of creative direction. I do audio, video, graphic design. I've been a graphic designer for 20 years. I've been doing it for a very long time. And kind of moving into the direction of uh, production and consulting and helping with, I, I mean, I listen to your podcasts because I edit it. So I'm kind of forced to hear all of this stuff. <laughs> and then I actually coalesce it into some interesting ideas and concepts that I bring back to you and actually help with some of the content aspect of things. So I presented with you, since I'm here in Gettysburg hanging out, I presented you guys with this idea of generational shadows that yeah. I was noticing by doing some inner shadow work myself and trying to figure out some aspects of what was holding me back. Because I've started to reach a plateau in my career of what is the next step? What is the next thing? And how do I think about the next thing to do? And I realized recently I work in, I'm up in Rochester, New York. We have a studio space there, my wife and I. And we had some people come through that were sort of asserting themselves in a way that I realized made me feel very uncomfortable. And it happened multiple times. It was probably five or six times in a row. And I realized that there was this, this discomfort, this deep discomfort, almost a dangerous feeling. Like these people are dangerous. And I had this like, this, this triggered manic response to these people, just this intensity that I was just like, why am I so worked up? Why am I trying to move the chess pieces of people around these people to like make sure that they're safe? There was something that just made me feel like something was off. Hmm. And so I, I had to do some inner exploration at some point. I kept talking to my wife about it and she was just asking me the questions of like, well, what's going on with you? Because we talk about triggers and shadows and all of these things all the time. And when there is a trigger or I'm referencing or, or recognizing a shadow within myself, I can only notice a behavior because it's something I'm aware of or something that exists within me. At least that's my ethos. So I started to approach this idea of what did this person represent? They represented kind of a visionary in a sense. They have uh, someone that give themselves permission to do what they wanted, to assert themselves. And I was realizing that I just didn't have that in myself. And so part of the exploration and discovery of that was in the book Generations, as you can see behind you on the shelf. Um, Generations and uh, The Fourth Turning. I read The Fourth Turning and I was trying to figure out what were the circumstances in life that led up to my existence? Like, what made my parents make the choices that they made? What made me start to make the choices that I made? Not in a sort of blaming, outsourcing my responsibility kind of way, but there are, there are nodes in my life that led to my existence that yeah. have influenced me and led to some of the automaticity that I was doing. Like, having a trigger and a response is an automaticity. It's something that my nervous system is responding to that I'm like... Okay, what is this? Yeah. It's a signal. It's telling me yeah. something. So uh, I wanted to present this to you and start talking a little bit about generational shadows because to me, that's not just me. I've noticed yeah. in many of my millennial brethren <sighs> that there is a tamping down of authority. There is a non-committalness. There is a lack of desire to stand out and speak up for yourself in favor of the social realm or making everyone feel equal yeah. and feel connected and all of that. Yeah. So we're going to get into a lot of this, mm -hmm. but there's somebody watching or listening right now that just, this is an aha for this person because just the idea of, I have people in my world 
that have come into my world and I feel threatened and triggered. And for you to make the shift, Christian, of saying, oh man, it's their fault. They're doing something. They're making me, I've got to protect. I've got to defend. And your wife, Molly, you guys had this conversation. She's like, okay, what is this thing about you though? Mm -hmm. What's being drawn up for you in the trigger? What, what are you feeling through? What's coming up for you? What does this say about your systems running and how you approach the world? And you're going, yeah, I am going to tune to that. What does this say about me? I can't control everything in the outer world, but this is a moment of reflection for myself. Mm -hmm. And just that alone, if somebody's listening right now, I think that's a huge reframe for them. Maybe they haven't thought of that before. Maybe that's something that's like a new concept to them. Now, some people listening right now, they're beyond that. They've already gone through that process, but that's a, that's a significant thing in most of our lives when that moment happens for us. Yeah. And some of that started by wanting to see beyond blaming my parents for my programming. Cause I think that's another thing like I've seen a lot of my millennial brethren doing is looking at our parents and blaming them. But there are nodes in this in systems that have led to their behaviors and their reactions. And it's just a continual cycle. And I think you've yeah. talked about on previous podcasts in about generational theory that it's cycles and really resting into the idea that these are cycles. And so for me getting to know that, helped me ease up on the aggressive attacking of my parents or of older generations or anyone else that wasn't me yeah. handling my own situation. So I have some stuff that I can share and go well, through. How old are when, you though? First, I am 37. Okay. So I'm, you're fully a millennial. You yeah, feel like you, 1985. That, you I'm kind of in the later, um, there's a, I feel like 1982 to 1986 is sort of this, uh, this, this cusp, this transition. Yeah. So there's aspects of me that relates to the Gen X ethos in some ways. I mean, I, I, I watch uh, stranger things and I'm like, yeah, I remember that yeah. as like plenty of aspects of my childhood that had some of those things in there, yeah. but, uh, more so resonate with the millennial. So I feel, I feel like I'm kind of in this weird sort of cuspy bridge area, which I think lends to some ability to speak to this. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, just to, uh, just to clarify the context, We've been talking about generational theory a couple of weeks ago. We put out multiple podcasts about generational theory and talked about it through the lens of the cycles and the seasons and some of the archetypes. And we've also been talking a lot about Jungian shadows over the last year. And like you said, you you are you're the video editor for our podcast. And so you've been hearing a lot of these things. Yep. And so what I hear you saying is, is that as you were listening to some of these podcasts, and as you were also doing your own research into generational theory, you were noticing that some of the triggers you were experiencing with other people were um, it, it, almost like generational theory was shining a light on some of this. Mm -hmm. And, um, and because you have a brilliant INTP mind, uh, you were taking some of these different aspects of the systems that we talk about. And we, we also have offline conversations all the time around mm -hmm. this stuff because we're all, we all geek out about systems and we all geek out about, you know, all these different um, theories and models. And so you were noticing that the triggers that you were experiencing around some of, you know, some of the people entering your life were also, you just mentioned being mirrored in people in your same generation. Mm -hmm. And so um, you, we've had t conversations offline and which is one of the reasons why we wanted to pop, you know, pop you on and be like, okay, so let's talk about these concepts because you had some real insight, not just into being of the millennial generation and watching your shadows and seeing them mirrored back in, like you mentioned your brethren, but also other generations having their own share of shadows, like the things they're getting triggered by. Mm -hmm. And so um, just to create some, some clarity, what we're going to talk about in this particular episode, isn't just generational theory. It's how this theory can shine a light on some of the the things that we're collectively blind to mm -hmm. based on assumptions about how reality works mm -hmm. based on the time periods in which we were born based on our generation effectively. Yeah. It's looking at cultural shadows and uh, just taking kind of the principles of how we look at our individual shadow, right? Mm. When we're looking at individual shadow, it's, it's our shadow can be represented by what we're triggered by essentially. Like you look in the, it's, it's a mirror. It's a psyche to psyche experience. We've talked about that before on the podcast. And if you're able to witness someone else doing something that you have pushed down because you've deemed it bad for you or yeah. you're, it's not getting your needs met, then 
that gets put into the shadow. Now I've heard a representation of the shadow being referred to as the heavy bag you drag behind you that every time you deem something bad for yourself, your ego essentially, I feel like is a junction point and decides whether something gets put into the positive, into the persona, something I want to present to people, or it gets put into our shadow, something we don't want people to see about ourselves. It doesn't disappear. Mm. We put it into that heavy bag we carry behind us and it drags us along. And part of me personally wanting to do shadow work is being ready in my life, having doing, done other personal work to be able to now look at some things that used to obviously be bad when you were a kid and now look at it and say like, I'm an adult now. I have sovereignty. I pay my own bills. Like there are things I don't have to keep carrying in this bag anymore. I can evaluate it and then I can eventually figure out how to let it go. So yeah. that was some of the impetus for some of the searching of this and realizing that there is, it, it's, it's the desire to seek out more triggers. It just happened to be that this one was an unexpected one and it was a big one. Yeah. So it really stuck out. And then I feel like it correlates to taking this principle of the mirror and looking at it from a generational perspective of one big old generational mirror yeah. and what tends to trigger a generation. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of orientation here. So if you're a new listener or you had, you have not heard the episodes we just recently released around generational theory, I recommend you go and listen to those because we lay out the theory of generations go through a season roughly of about 80 years. There's four seasons in that, that giant season. It's called a saculum, technically. So there's four smaller seasons, spring, summer, fall, and winter. And different generations are born into each of those seasonal cycles in an 80-year span called a saculum. Mm -hmm. And then each generation almost has an archetypical energy it brings forth. And there's four generational archetypes that cycle through. There's the prophet who speaks forth things into the world. There's the nomad taking their tools with them and figuring things out, hacking things together. There is the hero generation, you know, going to save the world and show up in a dominant way to to save the day. And then there's the artists who come and sing the songs of previous generations and help us create a new world and new understandings and new art forms and new expression. And then they cycle through over and over again. And so we talked about our generations, you know, millennials, boomers, Gen Xers, Gen Z, silent, all of these and greatest generation from, you know, my grandparents' generation, where they map on those different archetypes. So if you haven't heard those episodes, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is going to be uh, you're going to have to struggle to keep up because we're not going to cover all of that ground again. We're going to go into another layer of it, which is the shadows of each of these generations, specifically the the names, the the current names, like Gen X is the current nomadic generation archetypically, but we're going to talk about Gen X as Gen X mm -hmm. and then maybe some of the nomad shadow. And then the, the, the second thing is this may be difficult material. Like as you were telling me some of the concepts, some of your ideas around my generation, I wouldn't say I was getting triggered, but I was definitely resistant. Mm -hmm. I was like, that can't be, everything felt so tenuous already. Like I, there's so much to do. If I bring some of that shadow thinking, it's going to undermine everything I want to do in my life and our generation. Mm -hmm. And so I, I watched myself be very resistant to some of the ideas you brought forward. But as we were talking and I sat with them, I'm like, that's, it's probably pretty true. Like some of this stuff is probably pretty accurate. And so you listening, I'm going to ask you to do what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to set aside anything that could be either triggering or difficult or resistant. Approach it with curiosity. I want to hear some of these ideas. Let's talk about them. Yeah. Let me quickly define a trigger, or at least how I look at what a trigger is. Sure. It's, it's a heightened activation of our senses or nervous system. That's at least how I personally experienced it. Being put on alert in some sort of way. There's a sense of danger, like I mentioned, like these few people that came into my life, I felt a sense of something is dangerous. And especially at its most extreme repression of something that's very important. And that's part of it. It's like a lot of these are really important integration that a lot of us need to do. So there's also two different kinds of triggers. There's a defensive trigger that activates our automaticity, that activates an automatic response, that has this, this sense of, uh, uh, this is bad. This is a specific narrative that I've heard before. I don't want to get indoctrinated into it, or I don't think this is a great idea, or this is going to make me upset. And there's almost like a panic. 
and just want to get it away as fast as possible. That's more of the defensive trigger. And then there's a growth trigger. And the growth trigger is more of an open response. So if you think of a defensive trigger, it's almost like walking past a mirror and then you slightly see a reflection of yourself at the corner of your eye and you think it's someone else. And it's like, it kind of scares you. It startles you, right? Unless you, if you keep looking at the side of your eye, you're going to think it's somebody else and you're just going to ignore it. And you're going to be like, that's some other person doing some other thing. But if you turn and look at the mirror and you start examining yourself and you're like, oh, that is me. What's going on there? Like, why did, why was I scared of that? That's just me. Or that's something reflected that mm-hmm. I can actually own about myself. It's sort of with our physical attributes. Sometimes it's like, you have maybe a certain size of nose and you need to accept that that's just what it's going to be for a while, unless you do surgery. But <laughs> the idea being that there are defensive triggers and there are growth triggers. And we're asking for you listening to be in an open frame as best as you can, or to notice if you get activated into yep. a defensive trigger to just notice that because we're not here to get you. We're not here to trick you. <laughs> well, Tony might be, but you and me, Christian art. Yeah, yeah. You guys are good people. We're good people. Yeah, it, we're, it's we're me you have to look out for. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, where would you like to start when it comes to diving into what I'm imagining is an enormous topic yeah. of, of shadows that are associated with each of these generations. Which generation? Are we going to just isolate some generations and talk about them specifically? Well, I want to reference something real quick that I think is important that we don't maybe need to break down fully yet. Maybe it's something that we will in a future episode, but I feel like there's the, there are these dualities that are coming forth Mm -hmm. that I'm also noticing following this principle of persona and shadow. Again, persona, what we decide to bring forward that we deem as good shadow, what we repress that we deem as bad. And, there are other dualities that I notice. I mean, the book uh, Fourth Turning and Generations notes that there are some patterns that emerge from various generations. There's individuals and collective. You know, the boomer and Gen X generation tend to be more individual for various reasons. And the uh, the millennial and Gen Z tend to be more collective, right? We've got masculine and feminine dichotomies. We've got give and receive dichotomies. We've got inner world and outer work outer world work. And mm-hmm. then we've got, uh, what I'm calling narcissism and victimhood, but it could be a sense of entitlement or victim mentality. And these are some reference points that we might pull up in this conversation or something we'll talk about in the future. But I think these are important to think about when we're dealing with these sort of inverses as, as it were. So I think we can just jump right into the first generation that I think is important to talk about, which is the baby boomers slash profit generation. They were, Joel, do you remember the, the dates for the boomer generation? (sighs) Uh, I'm going to hopefully get these right. I believe it's somewhere around 1943 to 45, somewhere in that range. So we're taking Strauss and Howell's generational model. Mm -hmm. And that's where these dates come from. So I know the media has a lot of their own dates on these. Like there's a bunch of different date ranges. It's variable, right? But we're using it from the book, fourth turning. And uh, I believe it's 1943 to 1961 is, I believe, what the... I don't have a chart for 61 me. 61 to 64, yeah. somewhere in that range, I think. And it's usually... Uh, but, but I mean, thinking in the range is probably fine because we don't really need to uh, yeah. be, be precise. But roughly around there. Roughly around that time. So Early I, to mid-1940s to early 1960s. And what stuck out to me from the baby boomer generation is they've been they've been referred to often as the me generation. I think mm-hmm. Ken Wilber has a book called boomer itis and they're talking about the, the baby boomer uh, desire to focus on oneself, but the perception or what people see often with our shadows, it's like other people see what we can't see. That's another reference that I use with shadow is the me that I can't see other people notice it. If I repress it, people can still see it. I think it's gone, but other people notice it. And I think with baby boomers, I, many of us have this perception that they were social, uh, social activists and they did all this great work in the sixties and put a lot of energy towards the external world, solving civil rights and all those kinds of feelings. Um, but at its core, there were studies being done that point out that the boomer generation around the time of Vietnam, there was a lot of resistance. There was a lot of uh, activism and and fighting against the war studies being done that actually tried to denote where the worldview or the values of the people fighting against the war were. And primarily the boomer generation 
were me focused. They just wanted to not be drafted. Many yep. of them did not want to be drafted. There were people who were genuinely fighting for human rights and no war. And we don't want to see the world divided and dealing with all of that stuff. Yeah. But primarily there was a lot of me focus for that generation. And that resonates with me, by the way, because as a Gen Xer, raised by the boomer generation, we were pretty much left our own devices. Mom and dad, archetypically, now my parents were a little bit more involved in my life, but archetypically, mom and dad were out doing their own thing. They were focused on themselves. Mm -hmm. We saw in the 1970s, you could talk to any child of the 70s, divorce rates are spiking. Because again, mom and dad want to go off individually and do what makes sense to them. They don't they're not just going to follow the traditions that were handed to them because just because they're going to pursue the things that matter. And, and then we see, I think in the 1980s, a buy-in into like the Reaganomics energy of like, I'm going to have my career. You know, I didn't sell out. I bought in kind of mentality from the boomers <laughs> mm-hmm. and I'm going to, I'll, I'll take on debt, whatever it takes. I'm going to make money. It's about consumerism. It's about material wealth. It's about getting me in mind and making sure I've got my nest egg built up. I think that was really the ethos but it was birthed around this kind of like idealistic, what you're talking about, this idealistic, like we're going to change the world. We're going to push back on the war. You know, we're going to be very commune, community focused. But is that really true? Is that really baked into the ethos of that generation? And I, and I think the archetype of the prophet generation really guided this generation in terms yes. of speaking their will into existence. I don't want to go to war. Yeah. So people gathered around and tried to make that happen. Like they literally have megaphones, like mm-hmm. film footage of them, like with megaphones protesting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think of that as the, like the boomer right. image in my mind. Right. So referencing pe- previous episodes, you, you know, we covered a lot of this idea of, of the prophet speaking what they want forward. And so to me, that brings out what I would say is an inner th- sense of authority. Their persona is a sense of authority, or you could even say authoritarian, but I'm not going to go, I'm not trying to say extreme in terms of the type of government that, you know, boomers would create, but it's almost like just a cultural reference point of very authority focused. I know what I want. I know what I stand for. I know what I need. I know what I care for. I'm going to speak it forward and I'm going to make sure that people galvanize around me to make it happen. So there's a lot of authority that goes forward and that's carried throughout their entire lives. So that persona is something that they've perpetuated throughout their lives. It's affected every generation following. I think Joel, you referenced to me when we were talking offline about how the next generation, Gen X, like picked up a lot of pieces or made things happen where boomers were desiring to make things happen, but they're so used to speaking things forward. They were not learning the skills to make it happen. Yeah. And then Gen X shows up and you learn how to make things happen. Yeah. Right. So, so what are we saying as the generational shadow for boomers then like be more specific? Cause I'm, I want to make sure I'm landing this yeah. clearly what you're saying. So we've got this authority forefront, right? Okay. This authority persona, I know what I want. I'm projecting what I want. I'm creating the circumstances of what I want with my voice. The other side of it is a socialism shadow. Now you mentioned they're, you know, going straight and narrow. They're getting what they want. They're making sure they're ducks in a row. They're getting paid. They're getting the jobs. They're doing all of the things. Now there is an aspect of baby boomers growing up in a post-war time period where there was a lot of social rules and the social rules if they engaged in them, they saw them as dangerous, meaning that their parents were more engaged in the social rules and they just had to follow them. Yeah. The, they were not defining social rules. They were just engaging them and perpet- and really just assigning themselves to the system. Now we've got these narratives again of, of baby boomers going through their lives and speaking into existence what they want. And it seems like people get this impression that they're, they're more doing social good, again, they're focusing on themselves, but there is this greater sense that baby boomers don't realize, or we get this, I think people look at baby boomers and they realize that you're very dependent on the system, Mm -hmm. even though they, they push that down. They do not express that they are dependent on the system. Typically they express what they want. I want to make this happen, but in order to make that happen, it happens because of how embedded into the social systems that they are. So even today in today's politics, they're championing the previous system. You referred to it as more of a TE or effectiveness system that is changing now into more of a harmony FE kind of system, which I agree with. And it's really hard for them to make that transition right now. They're grasping onto that because it's, It's what allows them to feel like they have a voice and that voice is something that they can use. And so if that, that ability to use that voice is fading, they are 
going to shrink and shrink and focus on their own peer group and social system more and more and more. And it's isolating them from their kids, from their grandkids. And uh, it's kind of sad to see they're not really stepping, uh, at least a lot of what I've experienced, they're not stepping into elderhood in a um, nurturing, supportive uh, way that is self-sacrificing. Mm-hmm. And really, that's what I mean by socialism. It's like the sa- self-sacrificing Let's distribute our wealth to people that need it. Let's help people that are, you know, in need. Otherwise, it's it's just it's just me, the me generation. And the converse that is everybody. The converse to that is everybody. So when we when we see our shadow, we see opportunities for growth. So as we go through each of these generations and talk about their their shadows, there's an opportunity for growth on the other side or an opportunity for them to, you know, step into something more. Mm. And for, um, I want to throw this over to you mm-hmm. for boomers, the, um, that, uh, that profit authority, like we, we tend to demonize that, but there's a lot of really good stuff that has come from that, mm-hmm. right? There's a lot of vision that has come from boomers. Mm-hmm. Like Steve jobs was a boomer, right? And, mm-hmm regardless of whether or not you like Steve Jobs, but there was a lot of forward movement that has happened from the visions of prophets. Mm -hmm. And while they may or may not have been implementing themselves or allowing, uh, you know, younger generations to implement for them, that authority is actually admirable in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, So at this point, being used to having that authority, being used to being listened to, being used to being able to put your, your, you know, have people sort of organize around your vision when a prophet becomes, you know, they enter that time period of elderhood, if they can integrate that shadow part, if they can see that part, which is actually, it's for everybody's good. It wasn't just for me. It was actually for everybody's good. Mm-hmm. Um, what's, what is a, a piece of advice possibly and an opportunity to manifest the best version of themselves in this cycle of life, do you think? Yeah, and this is probably a good point to, to mention that integration does not mean like a surrender. To the shadow necessarily because sometimes that's sometimes that feels like that can be the instinct to say like well if this is something i'm repressing and you're maybe going deep into growth work you're like well let me just lean in and give into all of it and it's not necessarily the case either but it's just an awareness that that there's a there there's this part of you that is valuable that is happening anyway but you might as well be aware that it's happening and then have some control over it mm-hmm. so for, for baby boomers, I think it's like showing up. I think it's showing up to, uh, to your family, to your kids, to your grandkids, owning that elder role, but then showing up in ways that are bigger than yourself. Showing up to the show you didn't write. Showing up to the show you didn't write. Yeah. Like showing up to the, cause I'm realizing you're saying show up. I'm like, why are, what's the resistance? And it's because, well, it wasn't my idea. It wasn't what we put forward. It wasn't our values. Mm-hmm. So we'll just go do our own thing because that's what we agree with over here. Caring about other people's ideas, caring about other people's needs, caring about other people well, than yourself, not completely dismissing uh, uh, yourself. I, if I was a boomer hearing that, I would be very angry. You said yeah. that. Like, what do you mean? I don't, <laughs> I care about my, I care about other people's needs. I would think a boomer would be like, of course I care about other people. Mm-hmm. There's probably a nuance here that we're after. Well, like, it's not just care about other people because I think they get that a lot from millennials, especially like you don't care. Give, you know, yeah, I'm not trying wealth. to be one of that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, what I think the message for boomers, though, they hear is like you, from millennials is you guys hoard your wealth. You don't give. You won't contribute. You just you won't play nice. You're selfish. Yeah. You hoard, 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 hoard your energy resource and all of that. And that's not exactly what you're saying. Correct. Uh, can I give an example in my personal life? Yeah. That might illustrate the point. Mm hmm. So my mother is a boomer. My father was an artist generation. He's now passed away. But my mother is a boomer. And um, the message I get from her is until I engage and interact with her on her terms, mm-hmm. uh, she she has to wait to have a relationship with me. Right. So And it's always communicated with great love, like I'm breaking her heart. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm no longer part of the religion I was raised in. And the... And I know that this is extreme, so I'm not saying that the, this would be all boomers. In fact, a lot of boomers would probably find this somewhat offensive, but it's an extreme case that I think illustrates the point, mm-hmm. which is uh, until I return to the religion, I can't have a relationship with her. Yeah, And that's heartbreaking to her, and she mm-hmm. communicates like she loves me, she misses me, but I have to 
basically play by her rules or I have to play in the rules that she's chosen to play in. They're actually not her rules. They're somebody else's rules, right. which is what you're talking about, this shadow of in socialism. A way, in a way, it's recognizing how people have made sacrifices for you mm-hmm. and then being willing to make more sacrifices for them. Not going extreme in the socialism direction of not doing anything that is important to you. But I'm starting with the idea of like your kids and your grandkids, like asking yourself, like to what degree are you willing to sacrifice on their behalf, your time, your attention, your energy and giving and supporting. And I think this is the split because I think boomers would say, well, this wealth that I've gathered, that I'm holding, that I'm stewarding, that is going to go to my children and my grandchildren. All the things I've built, maybe resource, and they forget, well, we don't want you after you're dead. Mm-hmm. We want you now while you're alive in right. a lot of ways. And I think there's, I think that's really what you're speaking to. Well, in some is, ways, I think the shadow is, is waiting for the system to give them wealth for them eventually. Like the old system that boomers have relied on, the TE effectiveness system that I was talking about, the system yep. that they, they grew up into is no longer existing or it's at least evolving or changing. There may be an expectation, again, if you're listening, this is up to you to determine if this is true, but this this may be an assumption that if I have my money in retirement or I have my time and attention in another place that it's going to pay dividends for my kids and grandkids eventually via the the systems. Mm-hmm. Yes. Right? The instead 401K of, instead of directly all. from me. And I think a lot of what you're expressing, what I'm expressing, we've talked about from our, all of our parents, like we have this idea that like they're not going to come to us. Well, we have to either wait for it to be their idea for, for us to come to them. And it's like, be proactive, mm-hmm. make it your idea to go to see your grandkids, like be involved in their life. So in the situation I'm talking about, it's like, there's a system my mom is a part of, and I have to meet her at the system. Right. And you're and it's an extreme case. I understand, but it illustrates the points like these, this is, we have to, we have to all meet over here. And what you're recommending is to let go of some of that and go, well, maybe meet your grandkids where they're at. Maybe meet your kids where, th- where they're at. Or at least meet them halfway. Or at least meet them halfway. And we actually have seen a like kind of a trend mm-hmm. of grandparents not going and visiting their grandkids. Their grandkids always get brought to the grandparents. Yeah. And that that is a bit of an older model. I kind of remember that a little bit myself, right? Mm-hmm. My grandparents never came. Actually, my grandparents never paid any attention to me. Yeah. <laughs> like right. older generations of grandparents that were like barely paid attention to, to grandkids. Right. And I actually think boomers are more active in their mm-hmm. grandchildren's lives than previous generations. Yeah. So they at least have that part down, right. that they actually are actively involved. Right. But there's still a bring the grandkids to the grandparents as right. opposed to the grandparents coming to the grandkids. And the reason I wanted to differentiate the defensive trigger versus the growth trigger is because I know, plen- like I'm going after everybody right, right now. Everyone's going to be We're a little upset. Started with the boomers. <laughs> but it's not, a, I have no personal tie to you being upset. This doesn't make me feel superior to make you upset. <laughs> but the idea is that it just gives you something to think about yeah. and, and, and listen to your body and see if it makes you feel something. Well, how many, how many boomer thinkers, academics, politicians, media personalities, in my view, are still talking about things that they were talking about in the 1960s mm-hmm. as if they're just as relevant in the same way today as they were in 1967, let's say. Right. The world's changed a lot in 50, 60 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a very different world than like the mid to late 60s in a lot of ways and yet it almost feels like we still have to go back into maybe i'll just use one academia in the same way of the professors of the 60s and talk about it in that way otherwise it doesn't count like you come into our turf in the way a prophet would talk about it yeah and then we can address these issues we can't do it outside that system yeah and and i'm i'm thinking about making sure that it's not this is not me bringing my authoritarian shadow and being insistent that you be something sure when i understand that there's a a sensitivity here like mm-hmm. you're getting older you're experiencing and probably contending with your mortality you're maybe trying to avoid thinking about what's next mm-hmm. you're very focused on what's been before or what's been a part of your life this whole time and what you want your kids to have is what you had but it's it's thinking about the actuality of the way the world is now and if there is a vision for creating a greater world or something that is important to you that is reminiscent of the world you grew up in Hmm. How can we then bring that ethos into how you can operate with your kids and grandkids going forward, hmm. as opposed to trying to 
turn back the clock. Well, and there's there's so much to share because uh, boomers have lived through so much. Mm-hmm. Like like we we talk about you know some of the traumas we experience in life right now, but boomers in the '60s, it's like hard to communicate some of the things that they went through mm-hmm. in the '70s. Like they have so much life experience, so much wisdom. They've seen so much. And I would imagine that archetype, you know, archetypically a prophet generation would very naturally rest into a sage role when they're older Mm -hmm. to dispense wisdom, to dispense all the things that they've seen. And so in some ways we really need them to do, to, to not wait for things to come to them on their turf, but to, to be willing to be like a bodhisattva, right? The, Mm -hmm. The Buddha sits at the top of the mountain but the bodhisattva goes and visits the Buddha and then brings the messages down to the village. And we, we need them to be a little less Buddha and a little more bodhisattva, mm-hmm. a little more bringing wisdom to meet people halfway as opposed to you having to go to the top of the mountain to get that to get that wisdom. And that's the integration of bringing the me to the scenario. Yeah. You're bringing yourself to your grandkids. Mm-hmm. You're bringing your wisdom. You're bringing your life experience. And I think that would be something very valuable for your family and legacy going forward. Mm-hmm. So we're getting ready to go to the, the best generation of all of the ones we're going to talk about here in a moment. But before we get to the best, yeah. uh, right here sandwiched in the middle of all of it, um, I am I wrote down the word enablers, and I just wrote a little chart, and I just identified. So I, I have a feeling, I have this instinct, that the shadow also is an enabling energy in a generation that actually creates the opposite of what their intent or desire was. Mm. So somehow this boomer generation in their shadow is creating, they're enabling through their energy, the shadow is, or something's creating the actual disregard of the wisdom they have to speak to us. Mm. They have wisdom to give us, and yet we're discounting it or disregarding it for some reason. Right, like the okay boomer thing. It's like, what a... Yeah, I mean, of all the things... What an undermining... It's the most dismissive thing you could say, and yet they're the most tapped into speaking and articulating the Mm. prophecies. They have prophecies, quote unquote, not like biblical prophecies, but you know what I mean? Like Mm -hmm. these ideas putting forth, and yet they're also very disregarded at the same Mm -hmm. time. Yeah, and sometimes these shadows, when we're not aware of them, they are what's producing the paradox in our lives. Mm just by simply not being aware that this is at play. Mm -hmm. We assume that we hit it. You know, like I recently discovered my 10 year old put a cheeseburger in my back seat. She hit it and to her mind, it's gone, Mm -hmm. but it starts to smell (laughs) and it starts to have an effect in the car. Like there are still systems effects to the things that we do thinking that it's out of our, our, our peer view, but it's something that we need to be aware of how we're actually contending with those things. Yeah, yeah that's a good good insight. Okay, so, so Gen Xers born between sixty one and eighty one ish. By the way, I grabbed roughly. the book when we were asking. Oh, yeah. boomers, Was I right? <laughs> uh, boomers, according to generational theory, is forty three to sixty, mm-hmm. and Gen close. Xers would be sixty one to eighty one. Oh, good. All 61 right. to 81 for Gen X. And while you, you jest and say the best of the generations, it sounds like Christian's coming for us. So. I know. Yeah, I yeah. Know. He already has. He's coming in I hot. know it's coming. That's why I had to say it. <laughs> well, you know, it's really interesting. We had a lot of conversation about Gen X, obviously, because you have a lot of representation here. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I ain't scared. I'm coming at you. Um, <sighs> I'm ready. But, you know, Gen X, you think of the nomad. You think of the nomad wandering the desert. You think of all of the entertainment that is relative to nomads, or at least I think of Blade Runner. I think of Mad Max. Mm-hmm. I think of the yeah. the lone cyborg of wandering the desert, trying to figure out how to survive or try to, you know, the reluctant anti-hero. Someone the last that's of us. The last of us. Neo in the Matrix. Neo right? in the Matrix. The one, mm-hmm. right? There's yeah. a specialness or there's a disregard, like can be sometimes at either end of the extreme. But either way... With Gen X, you have to make your life happen. You know, your parents have gone off and done other things typically, or you've entered into a a situation where you're like wandering the wild west and you have to figure out how to make life work. At least that's the ethos that's been generated amongst Gen X and each other. So the, the nomad idea is, I call it a meritocracy, or you could say capitalism. But it's like an embracing of that idea. It's embracing of, I need to make my life happen. I need to gather my own riches. I need to go find my own life. I need to go build my own life. It's like RoboCop needing yeah. to assemble all the little parts of me to make myself whole. And piecing together technology, needing to, you know, make a, you know, make your own VCR thing out of you know spare parts. It's yeah. that kind of ethos. I think a perfect representation a visceral representation of Gen X ethos is Burning Man in mm. that there's a, a desert 
and in a week, a bunch of people come together, they construct an entire city, and then at the end of the week, they dismantle it, and it's back to desert. Right. And that one of their core values is radical self-reliance, and they're in some of the harshest climate on the planet, on the playa, in the middle of summer in Nevada, and it's extreme temperatures, no water, and yet they just make it work. And it's all about expression and art, individualism, radical self-reliance. Right. And I think that's a really interesting view of what Gen X kind of stands for in a lot of ways. And there's a hierarchy. There's a strength. There's like, if you're dealing with other people in the wilderness, you need to be stronger than them or you will yeah. get taken out. Yeah. Right. So there's, there is this, this, uh, you know, um, you know, live by the sword, die by the sword kind of energy. This, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're not wandering from house to house, uh, with absolute trust in anybody. If anything, there's a lack of trust typically. Yeah. So trust is hard to come by. And usually who you trust is someone who is also putting in as much effort as you are. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is why I think that while we have this, there's this meritocracy persona for Gen X, I think there is a sort of community or even communism. I know that might be a little triggering to even <gasps> use that word what? shadow for Gen X by communism. Yeah. I mean, specifically a hierarchy of meritocracy, mm -hmm. meaning that I put in the work, and then I find talented people to work with me, right? It's not an open egalitarian socialism, spread the wealth to everybody kind of feeling. It is a, I put in the work, I earned this, I made it happen, but I also want to be helpful. I want to, I want to give to the people who are also putting in the effort and putting in the work. And so it's very different than some of these other uh, types of community, but it's like community created of individuals, of individuals who are putting in the effort, who are also cobbling parts together and making things work. And there's a certain respect and respect can equal trust and honor. So with communism, you've got a, you've got a single authority that then redistributes the wealth, right? right? And uh, you, uh, what I hear you saying is that the shadow is that Gen Xers want to, to have the wealth come to them. Mm-hmm. But resource, we could also use the word resource, resource, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. But then they actually tend to start redistributing it, whether yeah. they're aware of it or not. Yeah. And we'll talk later about millennials and the perception of Gen X who are, I mean, Gen X is starting to come online mm -hmm. in a bigger way. Like you guys kind of disappeared for a while uh, in, at scale. Right. And, and Gen X is starting to step into leadership, like you mentioned on previous podcasts and that leadership style is very contradictive to millennial expectations and younger expectations, which we'll get into. So, but it's, it's really embracing hierarchy. And that's why I mentioned defensive triggers and growth triggers, because there's really two different types of hierarchies. There are growth hierarchies and dominator hierarchies. And if a Gen X, a Gen Xer is going to embrace their shadow, it's embracing a growth hierarchy. It's creating systems that nurture growth and development. And then those systems themselves, like personality hacker who has, people that work within our system that are doing great work. We have systems effect on people who are our students and they have effects on people. And there's actually really great positive work that comes from that. Whereas perception might be otherwise. I, I'm extremely attracted to the idea, mm -hmm. the idea of working with a group of people of like minds toward a common goal. And the moment I say that I'm deeply just trustful that can happen. Mm -hmm. Like I want it, but I'm like, it's probably not not somebody's not going to pull their weight or there's going to be infighting or I was part of a religious background. So I've seen church split after church split and infighting right. in churches and community groups. I was like, ah, I couldn't be less interested in all that BS that would come with that. But man, there is something appealing about collective action, not activism or anything like that, but like literally getting together and creating a project together. Like we're doing here at personality hacker. Clearly we're, we're gathering people and we're organizing and we're producing things. And that is extremely appealing, but it's, there's a little nervousness around the idea that, I don't know, that communism idea coming into it. Yeah. Cause it's, you're, you're wanting, or maybe not fully aware that that's what you're wanting to, yeah. maybe there's this feeling, maybe it's cognitive function wise that you want to serve people. You want to be someone that is doing something big for the world but the way you want to do it may be necessarily what is repressed. This idea of like, actually what I really want to do is find talented people, put them in these proper positions and really own that. That's what I want. And maybe get out of this realm, which is part of the advice I can get into is get out of the realm of looking at people who are not doing enough or not, not doing enough, but like not um, putting in the work 
not mm. putting in the effort, not learning, not being willing to get their hands dirty. Yeah. Like Gen Xers love people who love to get their hands dirty. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. You know, and championing those people versus talking down to people who are not willing to step up. Yeah. Well, I think what it's, it's like a, it's daring to be optimistic mm-hmm. because there does tend to be, I mean, I find myself doing it, even though I'm like a naturally optimistic person, I absolutely find myself focusing on like where people have failed me or where it's more like where, where people are not capable or competent. Yeah. It's like, why is everybody so incompetent? It's like we, and we do, we, we, you and I will find ourselves on these like little bitch fests where we're just like, Oh, can't get the order right. Nobody can do anything. Why are they closing 10 minutes early? Like your, it's your job to stay open until, you know, until that time, not just, you just decided to close early. Like, man, we just get these, everybody's so super incompetent, judgy. Yeah. super judgy. Everyone sucks at their job. Everybody <laughs> sucks at their job. If I was right? doing this, I'd do it so much better. I'd do it so much better. And uh, so there's, yeah. it's a, it's a lack of trust and it's actually the opposite of the hyper trust in the system. It's a complete total distrust in the system. Mm-hmm. It's like the system will never, like you can't trust the system. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean with boomers, it was a, a time period where there was a high demand for order and a high supply of order. You guys grew up in a time period where there was uh, a, high demand for order, but low uh, supply of order. And then in the nineties in particular, like, you know, it both were just falling apart. Everything was starting to unravel. Well, and they, you know, uh, Strauss and Howe basically talk about how not us, we were too young. I mean, I wasn't even born yet, but there's a lot of Gen Xers that watched the sitting president resign on national television. Yeah. Distrust. So it was just a distrust of systems. Mm -hmm. And that idea of a more communal way of seeing things like the shadow of it is actually, we kind of want everybody to get together. You know, um, it's really interesting to watch the show Stranger Things, which is about Gen X, a bunch of Gen X kids, honestly, mm-hmm. younger and um, older Gen X kids. And they're always running around in packs, mm-hmm. right? They're like these little packs of kids on bikes, these little yeah. packs of teenagers and cars. They're not lone wolves. Mm-mm. They're not lone wolves. Yeah, Mm-mm. exactly. And it feels very true. It also feels like they're getting things done and they're like making it happen and they're solving these. I mean, obviously they it's can't a, trust the system to solve it. The cops, they have to right. do it themselves. They can't they, trust like, the but they know that each one is capable of figuring stuff out. That's right. Each yeah. Their own skill. Yeah. yeah. And, and they'll jump in after each other and like mm-hmm. go to, and so um, there's that sense of like wanting that community so bad, right. but just not trusting that anybody's going to be capable of doing it. Right. And so with boomers, you've got this individualism that has this collective shadow with Gen X, you've got this individualism that has a collective shadow. And, it, and again, it's just the shadow of recognizing that that exists. Mm-hmm. You want to work with other people. Right. You want to work with people that are doing good work and who yeah. are adaptable. Well, and there's a, that cynicism can be overcome because I think, um, and, and it almost sounds like the shadow of Gen X is all positive, but the truth is, is that Gen Xers, it's like, we have this attitude about being ignored Mm -hmm. And we're like, fine, we'll ignore you then. Right. Like there's just, it's a, it's a, um, it's, it almost comes from like hurt. (laughs) You can feel like it comes from collective hurt. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a being willing to just throw everything away. Yeah. And, and because we grew up in sort of a harsh context with each other, it was Mm -hmm. very dog eat dog growing up. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also a sense of, um, grit. Yeah, there's a sense of grit and a willingness to do what it takes. It's not necessarily, it's not creative in an artistic way, but it's a creative in like just make it happen way. Yeah. And uh, and I think that's really, that energy is really needed right now. Mm-hmm. But extras just kind of go, eh, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think it's, it's almost like a, um, the part of the shadow is that you feel so responsible to make things happen. Mm-hmm. You actually end up, not taking responsibility for something bigger that you could actually impact for the better. Right. It's a lack of responsibility, even though this is actually a fairly res- personally responsible generation. And maybe sometimes actually letting yourself be at the top of the pile, like at the top of the hierarchy to let yourself take the credit for all the work that you've done mm-hmm. and do the redistribution, redist- redistribution of the wealth that way mm-hmm. uh, or resources to the people that are, filling that role of being competent and caring like your you know the the gen x shadow the negative part is being a jerk to a lot of people yeah (laughs) yeah yeah, exactly yeah and it's like not playing well with others yeah yeah it's like a desire to play well with others while not really being able to play well and so it's really a shift in focus yeah shift from focusing on 
incompetence to competence. Mm -hmm. Finding people, especially young people who have potential, Mm -hmm. especially as you're stepping into leadership, like finding people who have potential, nurturing that potential, focusing on them and less on all the other. Because there is an infinite number of people who are incompetent relative to your expectations. And that will keep you unfocused and on that spinning wheel forever. Well, and we found in Personality Hacker, like part of the reason why we, you know, we're like, well, that person didn't work out or whatever. Like if we had any sort of, you know, any sort of frustration um, is that we we weren't doing our job as leaders. Mm-hmm. Like we were giving this short... This is key. This, this is key. We were doing short descriptions. Like I need this and this and this and then throwing it at the person. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean... That's kind of how we were raised. In right. high school, I can't tell you how many assignments I got that were like two or three sentences of vague descriptions of things, and I just had to go figure it out before the internet, right? Yeah. It's like, make a diorama that blah, 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 blah. And it's like, we never talked about dioramas. What's a diorama? I guess right. I have to go look it up at the library, right. right? And so I had to go figure out what a diorama was first, and then I had yeah. to figure out all these other elements. And yeah. so two sentences, and I was expected to do something, and this is worth 50% of your grade, yeah. right? And so we do that. We tend to like throw little chunks of information at a person and go, okay, go figure it out. Yeah. And when they can't, we're like, what is the problem? Yeah. And then when we were hiring younger people that we were doing our job with leadership, like Joel would sit with the person. And I mean, we have uh, Anessa, our business manager. She's absolutely amazing. But Joel met with Ines basically what every day, every working day for how long? Like, almost two years. Almost two years. She's incredible. Mm-hmm. She's incredible. And well, a lot part, of that's because of her, not because of me. <laughs> right, right. Well, she's just an incredible person that knows what she's doing. That is also true. And uh, I wonder if we had done treated her the same way that we treated people yeah. previously, yeah. if we would have never been able to see that potential. And maybe people before had that potential, right. but we just didn't foster it. Right. You stepped into a mentor role instead of a barking orders role well, instead of a federated co-worker role mm-hmm. and that's i think that's really the so what i'm taking from this the, the communist shadow I'm, I'm may not be exactly the details but it's the understanding i'm going for so my intuition's patterning this together yeah this idea of we were in groups but we were all individually specialized doing our hacker thing like you might be specialized in something else and you and i don't want to be above or below anyone i'm just going to do my thing my role is in my my role and I've got my tools and I do my thing and you do your thing and we all are kind of equal in a lot of ways. Like it, yeah, we'll, we'll get benefits based on how competent we are, but you do your thing. I'll do my thing. And really what I hear the message or the call for Gen Xers at this point is somebody needs to step into the guidance, the mentorship and the leadership as well. Mm -hmm. And that is also a role, but that you can't do by yourself. You can't just go and do it off in your room by yourself or in your office by yourself by definition, it requires you to incorporate other people. It requires you to teach and lead and guide and be accountable and hold others accountable and, you know, go back and forth, which is like, ah, we don't want to do that. Can I just do my own thing? I'm so much faster. I don't, if I have to delegate now, I got to think about all the other stuff I don't want to think about. I'll just do it as fast or do it myself. And what we're saying is Gen Xers, especially this time of life is we're all either in midlife or have just entered midlife, like well into midlife, it's step into those roles. And you see it already. I mean, you see it, I think, everywhere in the last even just two years. I think Gen Xers are like, oh, I think we're supposed to do something here. (laughs) I guess someday the boomers are going to retire or die. So I guess we're the next in line. So maybe we should step up. And then we're seeing that happen now in politics and business and a bunch of different areas. Yeah. And I think some of this advice is the how, being a mentor. Yeah. Uh, looking for potential. You don't have to judge everybody and try to make everybody be of your ethos, but to look for the people who are already in that direction and give them an extra push. Yeah. yeah. And there's also like a little bit of laziness in there too for Gen Xers. You know, it's funny because as high schoolers or young people, we were called the slacker generation. Yeah. We were yeah. slack and we were, it was just, it was so irritating to be called slackers because we we're actually pretty hard workers mm-hmm. um, and we figured a bunch of stuff out, but there is a little bit of a slacker thing in there too. That's part of the shadow, yeah. I think is the, uh, do I have to take responsibility? Right. Yeah. And, um, and I think, I think another piece of this is, we're we're equipped for harshness Mm. and when we when we step up for leadership my observation has been that we actually get a lot of dogpiling Mm. right as soon as a gen xer and probably because we have a lot of personal authority yeah like we have a lot of self-sovereignty so when we put ourselves in a position of leadership we just bring our self-sovereignty there too and we go this is how it is guys this is what we're doing we get a lot of pushback for that Mm -hmm. but uh, and there's probably an avoidance right like i don't want to i don't want to have the crosshairs on me 
can't trust the system. Everybody's incompetent. Nobody will understand what I'm saying. Nobody's smart enough. And then when I step up into it, it's like, oh, well, look at that. I'm getting all this pushback. In some ways, we're kind of uniquely designed to handle all of that because of the hazing we got when growing up. Mm-hmm. So on some level, we have the thick skin for it. Yeah, you're like, yeah, 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 whatever. Whatever. Okay. I got to do what I got to do. I want right. to do what I want to do. <laughs> yeah. But I do think that there is, again, like a, the part of the shadow is that hurt mm-hmm. of not wanting to be hurt anymore and just going final be outside the system. And people recognizing that you do care about community. Mm-hmm. You do care about people. Yeah. You have like bigger goals than just yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a, it's a matter of being, um, nicer, playing nicer and being willing to, and being willing to be vulnerable while playing nicer. But you had mentioned authority and authority is something that millennials have a little bit of a struggle with. And that's pretty much going to be a lot of what we're going to be talking about with millennials, uh, as they tend to have a bit of a socialism persona. Okay. Before we go into all of that, I, I'm going to stop you just for a second yeah. here because we're going a little long, and I, I this is actually going to end up being a two parter. Right. Why don't we just why don't <laughs> a we end, cliffhanger? Why don't we end this episode? Because we've talked about boomers and Gen Xers, and like we got some good stuff out here. Let's pick up with millennials on the next episode, and hold that just for a moment. Yeah, let's wrap this up and start again, and then we'll have two episodes because I want people to be able to go through it. Now sounds good to me. A we nice got more time. space to do more things, and we'll Stand we'll jump in into the. The challenging millennials, oh no, right? Okay, a lot. okay so if we're going to go to two episodes, the cap on this one yeah. would be, you know, the the overarching thought is that for both boomers and Gen Xers, the prophets and the nomads, the it's a more, what did you say? It's more me-centric? Both of them are more me-centric? More individual mm-hmm. by persona standards and then more collective in their shadow. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think with with both boomers and Gen Xers, it's really about uh, being willing to, to, to turn the focus outward, mm-hmm. right? To turn the focus onto not just, uh, and, and it almost sounded like we were being a little harsh on boomers, I, probably Gen Xers too, but I'm I'm used to the harshness. <laughs> but with boomers, I think it's about recognizing that we we need your wisdom, we need your sage like, we need your life experience, we need your your um, sagacity. Is that the word? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but we need all of that col- that cold wisdom from your lifetime, and it almost feels kind of hoarded. Like we have to come get it, but can you bring it to us? We need you. We need that amazing voice you've had your whole life. Mm -hmm. And we need you to now bring it to us and to your grandchildren and to dispense that wisdom. And, and if you are willing to bring it to us, then you probably won't be as disregarded as it probably feels that your generation is. Mm -hmm. And then with Gen Xers, it's like, okay, Gen Xers, we kind of need you. We need you to step up. We need you to put be in positions of leadership. We need the fact that you have a thick skin. We need the fact that you can get things done. And to stop going like, well, I guess we're the ignored generation, so screw you guys. And a lot of people don't know what to do, and that's okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like like when somebody doesn't know what to do after you, it doesn't mean that they're an incompetent buffoon. Yeah, teach them. Right. So That's it, key. It, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's leadership, not with pointing directions and barking orders it's leadership with mentorship along with it yep yeah. exactly yeah and and then just to make sure i anchor this in we talked i brought the idea of enabling mm-hmm. that boomers shadow enables the disregard of their wisdom so what does gen x shadow what is counterintuitively hurting us is what we want as gen xers not attending to our shadow, not integrating it. What is it causing for us? I don't have a good answer for that. I, I saw the one with the boomers. Mm-hmm. What are we losing when we don't integrate this shadow? Is really the question. Relevance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're, yeah. You're enabling your own relevance, a lack of relevance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think that's, in some ways, it sounds like that's what a lot of Gen Xers want. Mm-hmm. But as you get older, I, I don't know how much that's true. Mm. Yeah. I mean, that's a question for Gen Xers and for you guys. Well, so, and the thing that comes up for me, too, is that uh, we're probably also enabling a less competent world. Yes. Yeah. That's like better. All the incompetence we see around us. Well, yeah. it's like, well, I guess it's, I mean, it, it, first of all, it might not be as much incompetence as we fear, but also we need to get to mentoring. 
Like if we want to see a more capable world, it's our job to teach people the th- the lessons we learned okay. in having to patch things together. So what I'm taking from it then, it's not just about the competence I bring. It's also the competence I can transfer. Right. Correct. It's how I can take what I've developed. Comp- it's not just about me and what I can do anymore. It's about what I can help other people do. I can help transfer this competence to people that I teach, that I guide, that I lead or whatever as a Gen Xer. And it's accepting that like being able to figure it out, like even though there's a lot about the time periods you grew up with that could be great or really sucky, <laughs> like it enabled a unique archetype. Yeah. And that mm-hmm. archetype has a placement in the saculum yeah. within the people, within humanity that's alive today. And that in a way is your role for existing. Yeah. Right. There's no Calvary coming. If we want the world to be more competent, then we have to be the ones who are, who are helping with that. And I think it's like a, it's almost like a hoarding, like uh, like it feels like boomers are hoarding wisdom and Gen Xers are hoarding competence. And, <laughs> and I don't know if everybody sees how competent Gen Xers are because we're usually pretty quiet about it. We just yeah. kind of quietly go about our business and do it. Yeah. And maybe it's a loudness we need to be. Yeah. We need to be more obvious, more in people's faces. We need to go ahead and take the arrows, right? We have to open ourselves up to that vulnerability and just yeah. make things happen and be better mentors. Yeah. That hoarding really resonates with me. So as you're listening along, we're going to go to episode two of this little short part series here on on the generational shadows. What's coming up for you? Are you a boomer or a Gen Xer listening along right now? And you're like, oh man, you guys are being tough on me. I, I disagree with some of the shadow stuff. Or maybe I, man, I, I don't want to see it, but I sort of see it. Do you resonate with the idea of a boomer wanting to bring your wisdom to the world, having to go and meet people? Do you resonate with the Gen Xer that needs to learn how to take competency and transfer it? to a new generation and step into leadership. All this stuff sound crazy to you? Want to hear from you? Come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your story. Maybe you've had some experience as your generation, as your archetype. You might have some wisdom and some knowledge to share with us through story form. Come over to personalityhacker.com and make your voice heard. Yeah, and if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various platforms. Android platforms. If you leave a rating and review for us on iTunes, it helps us out a lot. Uh, we have a video podcast. It's on YouTube. You might be watching it right now. If so, uh, what is all the phrases? What did the kids say? Like, subscribe, ring the little bell. Smash uh, that smash like. Smash the like button. Smash that like button. That's right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, let us know what you thought in the comment section comment section as well we have a book it's called personality hacker you can get it at all major book retailers and if you leave us a rating and review on amazon or in goodreads that also helps us out a lot yeah thanks to christian rivera for being here this week it's happychemicals.org is your website you'll be seeing more of christian behind and in front of the scenes both he works with us now in a lot of capacity Mm -hmm. and a lot of creativity so thank you for being here this Mm -hmm. week we've really had a good time talking my honor and pleasure Mm -hmm. and i want to get into the scary millennial stuff next week mm-hmm. yeah on the next episode owning my authority already you're, you're, gonna, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be the representative of your generation i hope you We're do a good do job it. i hope yeah. you do a good job all right my name is joe mark witt christian rivera and i'm antonia dodge and we'll talk with you on the next personality hacker podcast mm-hmm.